It's interesting to me to hear about swine dysentery because when I graduated 40 years ago, this is something that I was seeing every month. And, and I'm not exaggerating. The reason why I was seeing that every month is because I was working for a company that was introducing and finishing units, piglets from 20 to 60 different sow herds at about 30, 30 pounds. So we needed to have only one of our source herd infected to infect batch after batch of finishing pigs. And uh, so swine dysentery was extremely common in Quebec at the time, and today it has virtually disappeared. We have one case every two or three years. So um, what I will present to you is part of a very large presentation. Actually, it, act, it includes right now about 900 slides, and it's a presentation on clinical cases. And I was asked to talk about gastrointestinal diseases, so I just picked up three cases in that large presentation. So what I will do is that I will give you the history, the clinical signs, sometimes the lesions. And these are real-life cases. These are not cases that I have put together. These are cases the way that they have occurred. So I do that, then I ask you to find the diagnosis. When we, once we have the diagnosis, I ask you questions on epidemiology, diagnosis, and control. So this is the way it normally works because I suspect that the pointer is in the middle. The top one, okay. Yeah, normally, normally this is more a discussion than a presentation because there's a lot of exchange, but in, in the interest of time, I will give you most of the answers. I'm not going to give you the answers on the diagnosis, but the other ones, most of them I'll give you. So my first case is uh, a sow that uh, eats very little since farrowing. It has no diarrhea, no dyspnea. The temperature is taken on a regular basis. The sow has no fever at all. And then on day 12, all of a sudden, she does not rise, and now she has a strong fever, 41.3 degrees Celsius or 106.3 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it was in injected with large doses of two different antibacterials, and she died four hours later. So i leave you a little bit of time to think about it. This is the sow that died. So again, no diarrhea, no dyspnea, no fever for a while, and then all of a sudden a high fever, and she died a few hours later. What is it? Any idea? As I said, you know, this type of room is not, is not ideal for this type of presentation. It's, it's better with a smaller groove and a smaller room, but I'm not going to pursue until I get a diagnosis for that. So no fever initially. You know, there are quite a few things that can have uh, produce a sow not to eat. But how many things are producing a sow not to eat? It's the same condition. It's just that the condition aggravated to the point when something occurred that produced the fever. This type of problem is not that rare around farrowing because around farrowing, the sows are often not eating a lot. Ulcer. I heard ulcer. Okay, so we have an ulcer. That could explain why the sow did not eat. But what about the fever? Rupture. Rupture. Perforation. Exactly. So we had an ulcer that perforated and that produced a peritonitis. So that's the way it looked when I opened the abdominal cavity. So this is the stomach, and this is where the, uh, the ulcer perforated the, the gastric wall. So this is from the inside. I washed everything naturally. So you have the margin of the ulcer right here. This is the, the opening of the, uh, the esophagus, the cardia. This is the rupture again. And this is, this is the ophagus there. What can happen if I have a gastric ulcer? I have a gastric ulcer, the pig can die. The pig, the pig, the, the ulcer can heal with no problem. Um, I can have a perforation and a peritonitis. There are two more things that can happen. One of them is a reflux, is a phagitis, as in this case. So this is the aphagus of that particular case. So what's happening is that in some cases, when you have an ulcer, the, uh, the ulcer does not heal properly. And then the introduction, you know, the, the gastric juices from the stomach can go to the esophagus and produce a reflux esophagitis. There's another thing that the gastric ulcer can do when it does not heal properly. Sometimes 
um, the healing is such that you have a stenosis of the cardia to the point where in some cases the only thing that you can pass through the cardia is a needle. Okay, let's go with questions. Name five factors that can predispose pigs to gastric ulcers. And we'll discuss some of them. This one for sure, interruption of feed intake. And this is the reason why in some cases when, when people have looked at uh, uh, the stomach of pigs at slaughter, let's say that you send 100 pigs to the slaughterhouse and 50 of them are slaughtered the, day, the same day and 50 are slaughtered 24 hours later. Sometimes there's a huge difference between the, the gastric lesions that you have within the stomach. So the pigs that are waiting there for 24 hours without feed, normally the stomach does not look as good. You can have more lesions there. Diseases, and this is probably because of, uh, let's say, feed interruption, feed interruption of feed intake. These diseases can actually increase the likelihood that you would have gastric ulcers. Small particle size, I think everybody agrees on the fact that the smaller the particle size, the more likely you are to have gastric ulcers. Pelleting, this is maybe not as clear-cut as fine particle size, but there are studies showing that pelleting can increase um, you know, the, the prevalence of gastric ulcers. And genetics, you know, I, there's, a, there's a practitioner here in the U.S. that has done some evaluations on bore lines, and there are bore lines that are clearly producing more gastric ulcers than other bore lines. Other question, why is it that small particle size can increase the prevalence of gastric ulcers? Well, if you look at the, the last edition of Diseases of Swine, the 2019 edition, what uh, happens in many of these cases is that uh, you increase the fluid content when you have fine particle size and you reduce the emptying time. And by doing that, the pH gradient within the stomach is lost because normally at the level of the parsophagia, <laughs> First, is of, do we say esophagia or esophagia? Esophagia. Okay, the part esophagia. <laughs> so normally this part is kind of neutral, and then the, the glandular part is more acidic. So if you, if you increase the fluid content and if you reduce the emptying time, you lose that, and then, you know, the, uh, the stomach doesn't like that. The Danes have considerably reduced the prevalence of gastric ulcers in sows. What have they done? So there was a presentation or a paper at the ESPHM, uh, the European Symposium on Porcine Health Management, uh, this year, earlier this year in Utrecht. And uh, uh, this paper caught my attention because um, what they found, this is in Denmark, what they found is that in 2011, when they made a survey, 25% of the sows had severe ulcers at slaughter, which is, which is high. So they said, we need to do something about it. They made efforts, and these efforts were primarily you know, focusing on, on particle size. And then they did another survey in 2017, 2019, and they looked at, let's say, 14,000 stomach, and now their level of ulcers had reduced to 9%. So this, this is about three times less, which is pretty good. And in the paper, what they were mentioning is that uh, what they have done mainly is to increase particle size and to add uh, roughage to the ration, so hay and straw. So what I did is that uh, I contacted uh, Dr. Thomas Sunderby Brun. I'm not sure if it's the right pronunciation. He's with uh, Sigis, the Danish Pig Research Center, and I asked him a few questions about what was, what, what was going on in Denmark. So 50% of the the, the sows are eating home mixed feed. A very low percentage, a very low percentage of sows would be eating pelleted feeds with fine, fine particle size. They did a trial uh, a few years ago where um, rations, sows eating rations with less, with let's say just 45 to 45 to 50 percent of the particles would be less than a thousand microns, and these sows had very nice stomach. But when they increased the, the percentage of small particle size, let's say smaller than 1,000 microns, so when they increased that to 70 to 80 percent, then they had uh, sows that were developing ulcers within five, six days. And as far as hay and straw is concerned, what I asked them is how do you do that? And in gestation, quite frequently, they use hay racks in the resting areas. And in lactation, they may give 100 to 150 uh, grams of uh, hay or straw per day. But, you know, realize that this is way, way different than what we're doing here. Because, you know, I contacted Dr. Uh, Steve Dritz. Steve is with uh, Kansas State University. And uh, he sent me 
a presentation that was produced by Kansas State University on particle size evaluation. And really, there are many, many details to consider when you're looking at that. But anyway, I asked him what would be your general recommendation. And uh, so nursery, it's about 500 microns. Finisher, about 500 microns. Gestating sows, about 500 microns. And lactating sows, finisher numbers. And then he said, as a general recommendation, if you have a single target for a feed mill, he said I would be about at 550 microns. So this is way, way, way lower than what they're doing in Denmark. Okay, case number two. The piglets are introduced in the finishing unit three weeks ago. A few piglets with yellowish to non-mucoid uh, non diarrhea and extreme growth retardation. The feed, that, uh, yeah, the feed contains the feed that they consume contains a preventive level of an anti-dysenteric medication. And at that time, it was either carbadax or ronidazole or dimetridazole. There was a necrotic colitis seen at autopsy. So I'll show you the colitis. So this is what it looked like. And I get back to the history. So introduced three weeks ago, uh, severe growth retardation, yellowish diarrhea. What is it? Salmonellosis. Yep. Well, that one is quite straightforward. So salmonellosis caused by Salmonella typhimurium. Salmonella typhimurium is rarely isolated from healthy pigs. True or false? That's false, obviously. It's really not rare. Salmonella typhimurium is one of the most frequently involved salmonella in human cases of salmonellosis. Is that true or false? True or false? So that would be true. So these are data from the Center for Disease Control in 2018, and the data that they had was for the year 2016. And as you can see, in 30, this was, let's say, first. Typhimurium was third. However, um, this one here is basically considered as a variant of typhimurium. So if I add this one to this one, then typhimurium becomes second and very close to being first. Multiple site systems have proven to be an effective way to prevent problems associated with Salmonella typhimurium. Is this true or false? That's certainly false. We have lots of that in the multiple site system. What preventive measures can be considered when Salmonella typhimurium is a problem? You know, the two, for me, the two first ones, as far as Salmonella typhimurium is concerned in terms of presentation, uh, to prevent the, the, these problems would be the use of MASH, preferably with large particle size and vaccine. The live vaccines are functioning decently well, not all the time perfect, but decently well. And MASH with large particle size, this is usually working really well. I have personally not seen, you know, I graduated 40 years ago and I've seen quite a bit of salmonella. It's pretty rare to see salmonellosis in pigs that are eating MASH feed. And I say that, and just last week I had a practitioner telling me that he just had a case. But MASH normally functions quite well. And then also you need to have a negative supplier. You know, of course, if you're buying gills that are all infected, then, then this is not uh, the right approach. And then you have everything else that can be done. Well, I went a little bit too fast. Why is MASH feed, particularly with large particle size, often a good way to control salmonellosis? So different hypothesis. So these guys here said that if you use, um, let's say, um, mash feed with large particle size, you increase the concentration of organic acids and you lower the pH. And then if you take the stomach, the content of the stomach, using this type of feed and you put that in contact with salmonella, you increase the in vitro death rate. And this is apparently associated with an increase in the undissociated lactic acid. This reference is suggesting that if you use, um, let's say, large particle size with NASH, you produce less mucins, and these mucins are allowing salmonella to adhere to the intestinal mucosa. And finally, this paper here in 2017, they say NASH and or large particle size reduce salmonella shedding and increase the population of beneficial digestive microbiota. After whom was Salmonella given its name? Who, who actually made this organism be named Salmonella? We, 
Dr. Salman, and Dr. Salman was a human doctor or a veterinarian? He was actually a veterinarian, so I think we should be proud of that. Daniel Salmon. The genus Salmonella counts how many species? How many species of Salmonella are there? So, less than 50, about 500, or greater than 1,000? Greater than 1,000, okay. It's actually two. <laughs> because you have now, and this is, and I, I realize that the nomenclature for salmonella has been pretty complicated over the years, but my understanding is that now there's kind of a consensus. There are apparently two species of salmonella. So you have salmonella enterica and salmonella bonguri. And then salmonella enterica has six subspecies, including enterica. And the genus contains 2,659 serovars. And of these, 2,639 are belonging to Enterica. What would be the proper way to name or write Salmonella typhimurium? No, this was news to me, because actually what we should say is Salmonella, the species is Enterica, subspecies Enterica, Cerovar typhimurium, or Salmonella typhimurium. Notice that this is not in italics, and there's a capital T, because this is actually not a species. It's a cerovar. If you look at Pastorella multacida, the genus is in italics, the species is in italics, and with a small m. Okay, last question of that case. How significant are cerovars other than colorless Swiss and typhimurium in swine medicine? So those here who have had cases associated with something other than colorless Swiss and typhimurium, Please raise your hand. Okay, I have two, three, three people. Okay, me, as I said, I, I began to work 40 years ago. I've never seen a case so far, a significant case, associated with something other than color Swiss or typhimurium. And, you know, there's one case at the IPVS 2002 where the, uh, the vet said, I had wasting, I had loose stools, pneumonia, ear necrosis in the nursery, and they did isolate Salmonella Hawaii from some of these pigs from the lungs and the intestine. And vaccination improved the situation. And then these two, this is, let's say, a proceedings paper. These two are peer-reviewed papers. But look in the literature and try to find in the peer-reviewed papers documents where they are referring to cases of salmonellosis associated with cerovars other than colorless Swiss and typhimurium. I could not find any. But I'm not saying it's impossible. You know, we have cases in Quebec where they, they, the diagnosis comes back, let's say Salmonella infantis, for example. But the fact is that it's really not frequent. But experimentally, uh, it's been possible to reproduce catarrhal enteritis with Heidelberg. And with infantis, they were also able to reproduce something. But it's rare. And this is surprising because if you look at people, people can be infected sig significantly, seriously with 20, 30, 40, 50 different serovars. Okay, my last case. A sow herd is populated in the fall of 2015, and you know it was underpopulation. The goal was to have 900 sows in there. So they were making modifications to the building. It was formerly a farrow to finish operation that was becoming just a sow herd. So in November of 2015, the first farrowing were uh, to be due in February 2016 they began to have diarrhea. So when the practitioner was called, the diarrhea had been lasting for 10 days. It was present in all sections, all colors, gray, yellow, green, pink, and red. This is quite unusual. You know, there are not that many conditions that uh, can do that. So all colors, pasty to liquid, some with mucus, no wasting, but some of the animals were thin, and uh, there was no mortality. What is it? Did I pass one? Pardon me? Feed toxicity? Yeah. <laughs> Feed toxicity. No, it's not that. Any other ideas? 
Okay. It was negative to PED, Delta Coronavirus, TGE, loss, and yes, Salmonella. It was positive to Brachyspira, negative to Hyodicenteria, negative to Pilus coli, but positive to Amsonii. So they did the sequencing, and it came back as a clade one. So this is what they did. Uh, the idea was to try to get rid of this, um, this bug. So uh, they used uh, Tylosin, 12, mm, 12 ml per gilt, once a day for three days. Then Denegard Premix at this dosage um, for 14 days. Uh, they also had rodent control, washing, disinfection, biosecurity, internal bi biosecurity, and they were able to get rid of it. Uh, no diarrhea in the following months. 25 gilts were tested just before farrowing to see you know, if they could still recover the Amsonii from these animals who were all negative. Uh, the pigs, all of the pigs that have been weaned and produced from that particular unit since then, remember this occurred in 2015, we are in 2019, there has never been any clinical signs. So it seems that it has succeeded. Now, the big question. The multiplier supplying gilts to this farm had no clinical signs before or after associated with Amsonii. There were no other farms. The other farms received gilts from that particular supplier, so no other farms receiving gilts from the supplier had clinical signs before or after. Feces were tested in gilt developers of the supplying farm and all found to be negative. This is the only time that this organism has been identified in Quebec. We're four years later. There's one time where this organism was found in Quebec, and it's in that particular farm, and it has not happened since then. The multiplier that is producing these gilts is still considered to be negative. It's not producing anything in the farm or in the, the farms that are receiving these pigs. So where did the organism come from? What is the water source? <laughs> Um, I don't know, <laughs> but it's a good question. Why? What could be in the water? Feces of what? Of geese. You said geese, Matthew? Waterfall. So, this is just an hypothesis, but the field just behind that farm in the weeks preceding the case was white with snow geese, loaded with snow geese. And the walls were open because they were making reparations, renovations in that farm. And the, the geese were just about 100 meters away, you know, from. So we don't know if some geese went into the farm, if, you know, employees that were doing the renovations went to see the geese and came back or rodents or whatever. But for now, this seems to be the most likely hypothesis. Now, you may say this is a little bit weird, but as Matthias was mentioning, you know, these organisms can be found in, in birds and waterfowl. So Dr. Rubin, 2013, he did identify Amsonii from gills from the Arctic and gave that to pigs. The pigs did not really get sick, but they did shed the organism. But this team here, Alar Moran in Europe, they again took Brachyspora and Sonii from waterfall, gave that to pigs. And of the pigs that were inoculated, four out of five had, let's say, feces that were from normal to wet cement. But one of the five pigs got basically swine dysentery, so severe mucoid to mucohemorrhagic diarrhea. So their conclusion was that wild waterfall were a possible source of infection. So not saying that this is what happened, but for now, this seems to be the most likely explanation. Or maybe that, you know, there was all of these geese, because there were hundreds to thousands of geese, you know, in that field. Maybe it went into the, the watering system or something like that. But that's a good question. I'll need to check that. As far as treatment is concerned, uh, this is just to show that, you know, there these uh, the treatment with thiamunin appeared to be able to not only uh, stop clinical signs, but at least in that particular study, it did uh, reduce, stop the shedding. And uh, in this study, they were saying that all strains had been sensitive to T-amulin. So this is, you know, what the practitioner had used. And I think, uh, oops, I had only one other question. How many subgroups of Brachyspora and Sonii have been identified? 
this seems to be changing because initially they were talking about clades one and clade, clade one and two. And now this particular paper is suggesting that rather than classifying that into clades, we should talk about genomovars. And this paper from 2018 suggests that today, at this point in time, we may have genomovars one, two, three, and four of Brachyspara amsonii. Thanks to Dr. Marie-Claude Germain, because this is the practitioner that shared this last case with me.